A student wants to register for a conference. Listen to the conversation between the student and the woman and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Look at the registration form. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good morning. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes. Is this where we register for the Beyond 2000 conference? Yes. What's your name and I'll get your conference bag. Well, I haven't actually registered yet. I was told I'd be able to register today, so I hope that's OK. I've just arrived in Melbourne. That should be fine if you're a student. I'll need to take your details, though. So, can I have your full name? Yes, sure. It's Melanie Mitchell. Is that M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L? -L? Yes, that's right. And that's Ms, not Miss. OK, fair enough. And what's your address, Melanie? I live in student accommodation at Sydney University, so my address there is Room 66, Women's College... Newtown. OK. And which faculty are you studying in? I'm in the Faculty of Education. I'm doing a Master's in Primary School Teaching. Right. And may I see your student card because I need to verify that you're a current student? Yes, sure. Here it is. My number is 994-578-ED. The woman asks the students some more questions about the conference. Look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and answer questions 5 to 10. OK. Now, do you want to attend all three days? The conference runs from Thursday to Saturday. Yes, I think so, if I can afford it. What does it cost? Well, you're eligible for a student discount, which makes it $15 for a day registration or $40 for the three days, though it is possible to register for half a day only. I'll register for all three days, please. Good. Now, will you be requiring accommodation while you're here in Melbourne? Yes, I suppose I will. What's available? Well, we have several levels of accommodation. You can share a room with another student for $25 a night. Hmm. Or you can have your own room but share the bathroom. I believe it's just down the corridor. That's $45. Right. Or you can have a single room with your own bathroom. I don't mind sharing a room. On second thoughts, yes, I do. I'll have my own room, but I'll share the bathroom. Right. Now, the conference fee does not include meals, though you do get tea and coffee in the breaks. Shall I put you down for lunch? That's an extra $10 a day. And there's the conference dinner on Friday night, which is $25. Oh, and what about breakfast? <laughs> Hang on a minute. It's all starting to sound rather expensive. Um, I'll have the lunch, but not the dinner or breakfast, if that's OK. Perfectly OK. Now, a couple of other things. There are a number of special interest groups organised. They're known as SIGs, and you're asked to nominate your preference. They'll take place on the Friday afternoon and Saturday morning, but they're filling up quickly, which is why you need to nominate now. Right. What are the SIGs? Well, there are six altogether. Let's see. On Friday, you have a choice between computers in education or teaching reading skills. Hmm? Or a session on catering for the gifted child. Oh, 
They all sound interesting. But technology in the classroom is really my area of interest, rather than reading. So I'll go for that. I can probably read up on the gifted child topic myself. Right. And then the Saturday options are a session on cultural differences, or there's music in the primary curriculum, or you could go to the one on gender issues in the classroom. Wow. Can I go to them all? They all sound fascinating. Afraid not. Well, I'm really interested in how boys and girls behave differently, even when they are very young. So I'd better opt for the third session, even though the cultural differences sig is probably really interesting too. Right. And the music option would be interesting. And how would you like to pay? We accept most credit cards or bank checks, but not personal checks. I'm afraid. Been caught out too often before, and cash, of course. We never say no to cash. I'll have to put it on my card because I don't have enough cash on me right now. That's fine. Enjoy your time here with us in Melbourne. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a discussion between two psychology students and their tutor. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen. Listen carefully. So, how did you find the lecture yesterday? Reasonably interesting, but he sort of rushed through Maslow's work, which, considering it's been covered before, is fine for everyone else except me, who missed the last lesson. Why don't you fill him in, then, Tina? Me? Oh, okay. Well, basically, it's simple enough. We all have certain needs, and what Maslow did was group them into categories. Depending on how successful your life has been or what stage of life you are at, your needs change and you shift from one of Maslow's categories into another. First, there's your basic needs. Physiological needs, the professor said. Is that right? Very good. These needs are pretty obvious. They're our most basic ones, things every human needs to survive and function, like air, water, food, clothing, and shelter. It's not rocket science, this bit. Maslow just points out that until we have satisfied those basic needs, our desires don't evolve into anything more complex, and we don't seek any greater form of fulfilment. Isn't that a bit irrelevant today? Not really. Millions of people in the developing world are still fighting to fulfil these needs, fighting for their very lives every day. Good point. So anyway, Maslow represented what he called his hierarchy of needs on a pyramid, or in 2D, a triangle. With physiological being at the base, presumably. Yes, it's obvious, isn't it? What's at the other end of the spectrum then? Well, to be at the pinnacle, you've got to have mastered the other levels of need. Then you are in the self-actualization zone. This is a place where you are very at one with yourself and looking to make the absolute most of your skills, talent, and potential. You can only focus on maximizing these, though, of course, if, as Maslow reminds us, you're fulfilled in every other sense. And what are these in-between levels then? Well, after you've found food and water and shelter and so on, the next step is to fulfil your safety requirements. Safety does not just mean your physical safety, though. That's far too simplistic. It's also about your emotional safety, your job security, and so on. And let me guess: after that, it's the need for esteem. No, Maslow reasoned that after your physiological and safety needs are fulfilled. 
The next most urgent requirement is for friendship, intimacy, companionship and so on. You know, on an emotional level, building a family, having relationships, etc. Only then, after you have found a sense of belonging, does the need for esteem take precedence, he argues. Presumably that's the need to feel accepted and valued. Yes, but more on that later. Do you feel more comfortable now? Yes. Thank you both. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. OK, now that you are both familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, let's look at a few cases in point. Case 1. Uh, crime boss in the slums of Mumbai, what do you think? Surely very low. Physiological, I'd have said. But he has food and shelter. A shed is hardly shelter. And how is living from hand to mouth every day adequate from a nutritional perspective? Oh, of course. You're right if you look at it objectively. But remember that human psychology is far more complicated than that. When quizzed, this person surprised researchers. First of all, he regarded his shares as adequate shelter and was completely content there. Secondly, he generally felt satisfied with his level of food intake. Thirdly, being the crime boss of the slums, he felt very safe, arguing that no one would ever touch him. He had no self-esteem issues either, since he had the respect of his fellow slum dwellers. It may have been fear, but he perceived it as respect. That is all that matters, and was quite content with who he was. I see. So it's not just about the reality of your situation, but also how you perceive that reality. Exactly. Most people would be very low on the hierarchy in his position, feeling like they wanted and needed much more. He did not. Now, what about case two? A multi-millionaire rock star. Well, you'd naturally assume he's fulfilled his physiological and safety needs, but when you read on through his profile, look here, he's plagued by paranoia and thinks someone is trying to kill him. On that basis, given his state of mind, he must believe that his safety is compromised. So safety must be his primary concern. Very good. And look here at case three, a property magnet. Having suffered badly during the recession, his portfolio of properties is in danger of being repossessed. In fact, look, he's in danger of losing everything and being left without even enough to support himself. Wow, so I guess he's gone from very high up right down to the bottom. Exactly. Even his basic needs are no longer secure. An excellent example of how there can be movement both ways on the pyramid. Case 4. A housewife. She must have some esteem issues, surely. Read on. She is quite content and well respected and loved by her friends and family. What's more, being a housewife is all she ever wanted to do, and she has excelled at the task. Therefore, forget esteem. This lady has maximised her potential in her eyes. She's right at the top. And case five? A very sad case. It is what it is. There are always innocent victims of war, and he was left with nothing, not even a home over his head. Every day is a struggle to survive. How sad. And last but not least, case six. Another rock star, though a different story. He says the only thing he craves is friendship. He has everything, but is awfully lonely. I think it's obvious where he is on Maslow's hierarchy. Indeed. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three.
You are going to listen to a conversation between two students and a tutor. They are talking about essays. First, look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. As you listen, answer the questions. Write no more than four words or a number for each answer. So, Pamela, here's your essay, and Carl, you've already got yours back. Anything you want to ask or any comments? Can you just go over again for us how the marks for our essays go towards our final grade? Well, um, over the year. You're meant to write five main essays for this course. Yes. And each essay is marked out of twenty, which gives you a total of one hundred marks. Yes. This coursework makes up fifty percent of your marks for the year, with the other fifty percent coming from the written exam. Right. So the five essays contribute to fifty percent of our final grade for the year. Yes.、Mm. You gave me eighteen out of twenty for this essay, which gives me a total of nine percent towards my final grade for the year.、Mm. And I want、um, to. And with fourteen for this one, I've got seven percent. Yes, Pamela. Does that clarify it? Yes.、Mm, yes. We did have it explained to us at the beginning of the course. When? In the first tutorial. Okay, I think we'd better move on now. About your last essay, have either of you any questions or comments? Before the conversation continues, look at questions twenty-six to thirty. As you listen to the next part of the talk, complete the table. Write no more than three words for each answer. You gave me eighteen for this paper. What was the big difference between this piece and the previous one? I actually thought the first one was better. Well, there was quite a marked difference. Really? Yes. It looked as if you had actually done quite a bit of research. You had quite a lot of relevant examples, especially on the historical side. You even found some information that I was not even aware of. Your sources were also very sound, and on top of that, your answer was very well organised indeed, and the writing style was very elegant. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much. I must say that it was the best piece of writing for a paper that we've seen for quite some time. I have to say, though, it took me a very long time to put it together. How long? At least two weeks. But it was well worth it. Can I just ask you if it's possible to rewrite the first essay of the term? It's really brought my average down. I'm sorry, but it's impossible. Is there no way to do it? I'm afraid not. Okay, right. I'll just have to try to do better than average on the others. And Pamela? Well. To be honest, on the whole, I'm happy with my marks. Again, your research was very good, and you gave quite a long list of source material, which was very good. I spent quite a lot of time on this essay, more than the others. Well, again, it shows. What about the organisation? I was a bit worried about that. Your organisation, I have to say, was excellent. Oh, but as regards your style, yes. It is slightly too informal here and there.、Mm. I think you need to tighten this up a little.、Mm, okay. I only wish I'd put a bit more effort into the first one as well now. But I would like to know how I can get my marks up even higher. 
What do I have to do specifically? Well, your work could do with being more thoroughly checked. You have quite a few spelling mistakes. Yes, I know. If it's anything, I think it's the computer. Hmm. Well, I'm not very good at typing. Two fingers, really. And when I finish something like this, I find it difficult, even depressing, to go over it carefully again. But it's affecting your marks.、Mm. Your previous essay was much better than this one. <laughs> Sometimes it's difficult to follow what's being said because of the frequency of mistakes. A couple of years ago, the university authorities would have been more lenient, but now they're very hot on presentation, and have been coming down heavily on things like grammar and spelling.、Mm. In fact, I am obliged to deduct marks from every piece of work which is not handed in fairly free of mistakes. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute. To check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear part of a lecture about the school calendar. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. So, having seen that the six-term system has passed the test of cost-effectiveness, we can move on to the educational aspects of this arrangement. Firstly, all the terms would be approximately the same length. Instead of terms up to thirteen weeks, which we have now, there could be a repeating pattern of seven weeks of term time plus two weeks of vacation. This would be repeated six times per year. How does this affect the effectiveness of the educational provision? The most noticeable result would be that the very long summer holiday would be reduced in length. This byproduct of the six-term system could be beneficial. There's plenty of evidence of huge learning loss by pupils during the summer holidays. By learning loss, we mean the amount that pupils forget or lose during a holiday break. Ashley carried out a number of analyses which showed this conclusively. He investigated thirty-nine studies examining the effects of summer holidays on standardized test scores. His analyses indicated that summer learning loss equaled two weeks to seven weeks of instruction. On average, children's test scores were three weeks lower than when they left school in the previous term. He also found differences in the learning loss effect according to subject. The subjects he analysed were reading, writing, and maths, and he found that the effect was greatest in maths and reading. Furthermore, although all social groups experienced roughly similar learning loss in the field of maths, the studies found that disadvantaged children showed even greater losses in reading skills. So the problem of learning loss in traditional schools is clear. However, the results of studies into the six-term system and learning loss are ambiguous. Marchmont found that pupils in six-term schools maintained their test scores after the shorter holiday period. This is certainly an improvement on the traditional system, where, as we have seen, pupils perform worse after the summer break. 
Benson, however, found no differences between those in traditional schools and on the six-term schedule. It would seem reasonable that if long holidays result in learning loss, then shorter holidays should result in less learning loss. So we await the outcome of further studies. Historically, of course, everyone knows the reason for our system of three terms per year. In days when agriculture was of much greater importance in our working lives, it was essential that the children helped with the harvest. Later on, this changed and more people moved into the towns. But then there was a new problem. Before air conditioning, it was very impractical to try to teach children in the summer months. Nowadays, that's no longer a barrier. One way of providing something different is the summer school. Here, there is a completely different kind of educational provision. Cooper and others investigated 93 summer schools and the results they achieved. They all had a positive effect on learning. Most summer schools, of course, have small classes and class size was shown to have a positive effect. Additionally, summer school children usually benefit from a great deal of parental support, not least because payment of fees is involved, and this, as so often, was shown to produce very good outcomes. Results were most impressive, in maths in general. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.